Hey everybody, it's Voltar here, and today we'll be installing my SNES RGB kit into this one-chip SNES. Now a long time ago I did a similar video with an SNES Mini, uh, and the board that we'll be using is the same, and the installation is fairly similar, but there are a few odd twists and turns that make the install process just a little different. Uh, but new to the installation will be the uh, one-chip ghosting fix, uh, which is something that I came up with after doing an analysis a while ago, uh, which simply involves replacing a capacitor to mitigate most of that uh, ghosting distortion that you see on one-chip and SNES Mini systems. So having said that, sit back, strap on, and let's do it to this one-chip SNES. <laughs> Okay, so as always, we're going to begin by taking this thing apart. Now, when I'm disassembling the SNES, I like to go ahead and remove all of the screws, and then I worry about the eject mechanism. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. We're going to rip all the screws out, and then we're going to remove this eject mechanism. Let's do it. Also, another very important note, um, actuate the power switch so that you de-energize the system. That's always very important. Let's continue. Okay, we're going to zoom in a little bit here on the eject mechanism, and we're going to talk about how to remove this, because it is fairly simple, but sometimes people get a little hung up on it, so let's zoom in. Alrighty, so we've zoomed in here nice and tight on the eject mechanism, and really, there, is, there are only three parts to this. The first part is obviously the, the lever itself, okay, this is what shoots the games out. And the second um, part to this is this sort of copper or brass um, shaft that runs all along inside the lever and anchors to the other side, and it just allows this lever to pivot back and forth, back and forth. And the third, uh, the third part to this is uh, just this spring, and naturally what's going to happen is, is when you depress the eject mechanism, uh, the spring is going to uh, force it back into position. Now for some reason a lot of people get hung up on this, and it's actually quite understandable, because if, if you kind of, if you do this, I won't say the wrong way, but in a complicated way, it can be kind of hard to put this back together and, and to get the shaft, to, to, to clear the shaft. So here's how I do it. I don't even worry about the spring. The first thing that I do is I just come to the right and I just, I get anything. If I can't get my finger in here, I'll just get a tool. I'll lift up on the shaft. As you can see, once you lift up on the shaft, it comes out quite freely and just start shaking it. Start shaking it. A lot of people say, I can't pull it out. If you shake it and rotate it while you're pulling it out, it'll come out like butter. That's every part to the eject mechanism and it goes back in even easier We'll handle that when we reassemble, but let's set this to the side. Let's continue. Now there's only one thing left to do uh, in order to remove the main board. And actually the, the main board's ready to come out. Uh, so what you can do is just lift up on it. And we have the ribbon cable here that interfaces the controller ports to the main board itself. So just simply get a firm sort of handle on that and pull out, board's free. We'll discard the bottom case and move it to the side. I want to flip this baby over because that's where all the magic's going to happen. Now, before we seat and situate our amp into position, uh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to remove some components off of the main board in order to pull the current RGB circuit out of circuit, C-Sync included if we need to remove C-Sync. But let's pan down the board here and let's just take a look at something real quick. Okay, down here we have the supporting circuitry that buffers the composite sync off of the one chip. Uh, and it actually does a quite good job of that. So there's no reason for us to, to um, route composite sync uh, through my board uh, and, and jam it out of the, uh, the multi-out interface here. It's just not necessary. Uh, this is perfectly safe and perf perfectly healthy and it's, it's ideal. So we're going to leave this alone. And having said that, we're going to come back up here to the top. Now we have some components, like I said, we need to remove. Um, for RGB, in order to pull those signals out of circuit, we need to remove these three resistors right here. Uh, one, two, and three. 
um, I'll actually put a little annotated graphic up to, uh, to, to sort of show that. And if we were to remove composite sync, we would need to remove the fourth capacitor from the left, one, two, three, four. That would pull composite sync out of circuit, and then we could run uh, our own driven composite sync to the multi-out. Again, totally unnecessary here, so we'll leave the composite sync in circuit, and we'll pull red, green, and blue out of circuit. And we'll also clip these two leads, these capacitors, so that the board may fit flush. Let's do it. Now there are a variety of ways you can remove these components, and if you don't own a hot air rework station, it's totally unnecessary. It's helpful, but it's unnecessary. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to flood some solder onto both sides of this joint here, of this, of this resistor here. And we're just going to pull that 0805 package off. And we're just going to repeat this process down the line. So there is one analog output, there's the second analog output. And we're going to come here, we're going to just float this again. And there's the third analog video output. That part of the prep is done. Now we're going to clip these leads so that our board can sit flush. I'm just going to come in here and clip. Come in here and clip. Fantastic. Okay, so now that we've clipped these two leads out and we've removed the video out of circuit, we're ready to install the board. And that's very simply done. We're just going to come in here and we're just going to position the board on top like so. Make sure everything looks pretty good here, which it does. Seat it in there. Fantastic. Now we're going to begin soldering. Okay, now it's anchored in. I'm just going to go down the line. Perfect. Let's wire this thing. Okay, so we've zoomed in here to where we'll be attaching our RGB outputs, which is R6, R7, and R8. Um, R6 is red, R7 is green, and R8 is B, and this is directly below, uh, you know, the, the chip here. So this is quite easy to find. Uh, nonetheless, what I have here is some fluxed up uh, pretend uh, three conductor ribbon cable. I'm just going to simply insert uh, this ribbon cable into the vias of this uh, of the board here. So let me just go ahead and do that. Okay, those are in there. Now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take a tool and I'm gonna hold these flat, just like so. There, now, they'll, now that if you press them flat against the board, they'll for the most part hold their position there. So what I'm gonna do is, because we pre-flux those, I'm just gonna introduce my soldering tip and pre-wet that tip. Load it up here with some solder. So we can wet through the via and anchor these in appropriately. Perfect. Sorry if that got a little blurry on us, but now we're ready to attach to the board. Let's do it. Now, when doing the install here, I'm always asked, you know, Volter, how do you make this look so clean when you do it? Well, I want to show you. It's actually really, really simple. So we have our three conductor ribbon cable here, obviously, and I'm just going to start separating the ends. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the pinout here corresponds perfectly to the pinout of the chip. So I want to take the black lead here. I'm just going to start pulling until the uh, we make a 90 here to where uh, blue, which is the B pad, uh, lines up perfectly. So I'm just going to pull, 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 keep everything nice and straight. Keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling. We're almost there. Just another 1.27 millimeters right there. That's perfect. So fantastic. We've got that in line. I'm just going to come in here with my uh, flush cuts. I'm going to cut that out. That's perfectly in line. And now what we'll do is we'll just take our strippers and we'll just strip the insulation off. Like so. I'm going to go ahead and pre-tin that pad up if I can. I'm going to go ahead and pre-tin that wire too, just like that. Now I'm going to come in here, make this nice and taut like so, and it should really just sort of fall into position because we, we were pretty accurate with our measuring. So we're just going to do that, come down, perfect. And we'll repeat those steps for, um, 
uh, red and green. Let's do it. Fantastic. And I'm just going to finish this off with a little toothbrush and some IPA just to cut that gelatin flux off the board. Come right in here. Right. And that is totally finished. Now, I'm going to set the filter to off. Actually, the, the, the uh, low pass is always hardened off here. Uh, the TTL jumper really isn't applicable because we are using the buffered C-Sync that comes off of the one chip. And a lot of people ask, you know, why would you do this to a one chip that already has RGB? Well, it's kind of a complicated answer. Um, you know, depending on the one chip system that you have and the revision of the sRGB encoder on the one chip, um, you may get some noise issues. Uh, most, no, most notably is the vertical bar uh, that is most prominently found in games such as Final Fantasy III, um, Super Metroid, especially the title screen to Final Fantasy III. Um, it's, it's usually a result of some transient issues uh, with voltage uh, and, that, and that particular encoder. However, if we bypass it with, the, uh, with, the, with, you know, with our own driver, uh, that's pretty much 98% mitigated. Uh, so having said that, you know, the, the sRGB encoder is perfectly fine if you can sort of tune it up and uh, you know do some things to it to get some better performance. Nonetheless, uh, the, the best shotgun approach in my opinion for a cleaner picture and a better output is uh, to bypass it uh, with something that's been custom made and specifically tailored for the SNES, which is exactly what I've done here. Um, so that's the install guys. I mean that's really all there is to that. Now there's one final thing remaining and that's the capacitor ghosting fix. I talked about earlier. So let's pan down the board here to C11 and let's talk about really what that involves. Let's zoom in a little bit too. Okay, so we've zoomed in here to C11 and just for the record, C11 on the SNES Mini is exactly the same capacitor as C11 on all one chip revisions. Meaning if you replace C11 on the one chip, if you have an SNES Mini, it's going to be the same capacitor. So they both do the same thing uh, on their respective main boards. Nonetheless, about a year ago, I did some serious analysis to sort of try to hone in on what was causing the ghosting effect and um, you know, sort of those visual distortions seen on a couple of one-chip systems that I had encountered. Um, it turns out that C11 is part of the compensating node uh, for the current steering DAC that makes up the video section of the one-chip SNES's ASIC. Now, to sort of spare everybody of the technical jargon, this, this capacitor is responsible for um, stabilizing the voltage of the video output uh, and to keep it from swinging up and down. Now, when video swings up and down on the, on the SNES Mini in one chip, what we see is that sort of trailing effect um, uh, you know, around sprites and the sort of the, the visual distortions that happen on the left side of the screen. That's typically why you only see the ghosting effect uh, on the left side to the middle and very little on the far end of the screen because when you get to the, when the screen is almost drawn, I mean, the screen is drawn from left to right on every line, uh, this capacitor is, is up to, up, it has plenty of gas at the end, but at the beginning when video starts, there's just not enough gas here and video is going to swing up and down. So nonetheless, the fix for this is to replace this, if you're having trouble, with a capacitor value of anything between 200 nanofarads and 470 nanofarads. Ideally, I think anything within the 300 nanofarad range is ideal, but those sort of, that range of values, it's the most safest bet. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. Uh, it's an 0805 package on the um, all one chip boards, and it's an 06 package um, on the SNES Mini. So I'm just going to work this off, and I'm going to replace it. Let's do it.
Now, just as I said earlier, I'm going to show how to reinstall this eject mechanism. So we'll start with the shaft, and you want to carefully insert the shaft into the hole of the eject mechanism so that it fits all the way through. Okay, work it in there nicely. And what I want to do is I'm going to take our spring, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to line it up here with a little key, the little indentation, like so. Whoops, just like that. So the spring's in place. That's all we have to do there. Now I want to bring this in. Actually, I want to turn this at an angle so you can see this. If you want your eject mechanism to be a little more potent on its springy side, what you can do is sort of insert that shaft in there. And I want to, you see this slot? It's not supposed to go in there, but it can. Insert the spring into this little groove. And this will just put more, whoops, this will just put more tension on that spring. It's kind of tricky to do. So if you can see that, you can see my finger wiggling there. I'm going to put it in that slot just like so. <sighs> Perfect. It's in the slot. Now your eject mechanism comes up with a lot more force. Let's put it back together, let's test it out, and let's close this up. And um, my gosh, look at that. No vertical line, no vertical bar. Um, beautiful picture, uh, fantastic quality. Um, and this is done. I mean, this is the, from start to finish, um, whole modification. Now, one thing I forgot to mention about the uh, ghosting fix for both the SNES Mini and the One Ship is that you may run into some games that might exhibit some sort of um, visual weird distortion and that's simply because the way the brightness register was implemented on the mask of the ASIC um, typically what that comes down to is just a, a horizontal black line that may or may not appear at the very top of the screen um, you know you're just gonna have to research that and by your own discretion decide if that bothers you or not me it absolutely doesn't bother me and um, I like the ghosting free image so having said that I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. Um, you know, I meant to do this one like a long time ago. Never got around to it, but people have asked me, and I thought it was important. Until we meet again, take care of yourselves. Catch you later.